Hello, everybody. So my name is uh, Daniel Krijan. I'm from the R&D department, business unit COIL, the Fusta Optina Steel Division in Linz, Austria. My presentation is entitled uh, Patch and Yield Medium Manganese Steels, Modeling, Laboratory Development and Industrial Trials. So this work uh, has been a performed collaboration with the University of Applied Sciences in Wales and also Graz University of Technology, both situated uh, in Austria. So at the beginning, uh, please let me outline my presentation. So first of all, I will introduce uh, the topic. Then we will move to experimental procedure. And then the results part, I'll show you some of the modeling, laboratory evaluation and industrial trials to medium manganese steels. And then finally, I will conclude uh, my presentation. So now to the introductory part. Medium manganese steels uh, belong to the third generation advanced high strength steels with a combination of uh, tensile strength and total elongation exceeding 30,000 MPa uh, time percent. Their typical chemistry comprises of 0.05 till 0.2 weight percent of carbon and from 3 till 12 weight percent of manganese. There can be also some other uh, alloying elements or even micro alloying is possible to be used. The microstructure of these steels is ultra fine grained dual phase consisting of ferritic or highly um, tempered Martin stick matrix with a large amount of retained austenite, which is uh, mainly stabilized uh, over manganese rather than carbon, but carbon also helps. And this retained austenite is in a metastable form transformed uh, to martensite during straining uh, and resu resulting in transformation induced plasticity effect and therefore uh, such an extraordinary combination of strength and elongation is achievable and therefore this material is suitable uh, for the application for complex structural parts in the automotive industry. So now to the experimental uh, procedure. So we use a material with a was laboratory cast with 0.1 carbon, six manganese uh, chemistry. This material is laboratory cast and then uh, produced down by hot drawing and cold drawing uh, to a cold draw thickness of one millimeter. After cold drawing, so the material is subjected to two different uh, heat treatments. There's one step heat treatment and two-step uh, heat treatment. The one-step heat treatment, so right after cold drilling, so the microstructure is uh, heavily deformed. Therefore, we have a large dislocation density and also a large driving force for recrystallization. And since the material has a large manganese content, the transformation temperatures are low. And then we also have uh, austenite formation so by so-called uh, austenite transformation, also from undissolved uh, carbides. And therefore, it actually comes to competition between recrystallization and austenite uh, formation, leading in an ultra-fine gray microstructure, and in this case, um, with the polygonal morphology. Whereas, in the second case, for the two-step heat treatment, uh, there is an additional uh, heat treatment uh, imposed prior to this final uh, indectical uh, batch annealing in the batch annealing furnace. This step comprises of uh, full austenitization and quenching in order uh, to form a martensite. And this martensite has a large dislocation density, uh, but it's already recovered and is not high enough to trigger the recrystallization. Uh, therefore, the final uh, microstructure will have predominantly lamellar morphology. So now a few words to modeling. So we try to simulate the microstructural evolution by means of a demo model, which comprises the following step, steps. So first is the calculation of equilibrium amounts of uh, austenite and uh, cementite as a function of temperature, then also the ca calculation 
of austenite uh, composition, so mainly uh, carbon manganese, as a function of uh, temperature assuming equilibrium uh, conditions. So that means calculated by thermocalc. And then the third step is the incorporation of martensite formation during cooling, assuming that diffusional transformations are suppressed. And this martensite incorporation is made uh, by a Coist and Marburger equation. But this MS uh, temperature is calculated uh, by means of the formula uh, proposed by Mayeux. And now these kinetic factors can be used as a constant, or even more precisely, they can be used the kinetic factors uh, derived by Lee and the Coman, uh, which are uh, which are actually uh, the function of chemical composition. And then we obtain uh, such calculation. So I then I will then come more uh, more in detail uh, to that later on. So what is actually very important uh, for us for development is this uh, blue britain austenite line. And for us, as for steel developers, so we should actually dark somewhere around this uh, maximum uh, amount of retained austenite, where the cementite is completely dissolved and no martensite is formed upon the final cooling in order to obtain the best mechanical properties, as you will see also later on. Now, comparing the experimental data uh, with uh, this uh, stimulation, it is evident that experimental data are shifted to higher temperatures compared to calculations and it's due to the more reasons the one reason is actually that uh, in the model the protectoid ferrite formation upon final cooling uh, is not incorporated in the model and we know that, that this protectoid uh, ferrite formation takes place from our one of our publications furthermore grain size of intercritical austenite is also not considered we know as we decrease the grain size so we lower the ms temperature and then we actually move this entire um, martensite line uh, towards higher temperatures and the, the, then the same trends follows also this retained austenite line last but not the least it is actually uh the research that we dedicated uh, to and is the question whether a, a maya formula ms formula is actually representative for medium manganese chemistries and actually also uh, for the third generation advanced high strength steels as such. For this reason, uh, so uh, we actually uh, per we performed um, the investigations using 51 uh, different steel uh, chemistries suitable for the third generation advanced high strength steels with a variation of carbon, manganese, silicon, aluminum, chromium and nitrogen content by means of glatometry. So now I'm going that much in detail um, concerning experimental procedure. You can actually find it in this uh, publication. So I will go directly to results. And here you can see actually uh, the plot of experimental MS temperature as a function of carbon content. And you can see that actually this evolution could not uh, be described by a linear approach by a square function, um, square root function had to be used. On the contrary, in the case of uh, other alloying elements, so at the, so actually this evolution could be described by a linear approach. And then we performed um, multiple regression in order uh, to derive a new um, MS formula, where actually this carbon and nitrogen content um, have a square root function. And you can see now when we compare it to other formulas also um, frequently used uh, for the determination of MS temperature uh, for the third generation advanced high strength steels, like for example, the formula of Van Bohemen from Mayeu. So our formula um, achieves uh, much a better accuracy compared to, to, to other formulas. And even this also especially holds true also for very low MS and very high MS temperatures or also in other words for very high carbon and very low carbon content. So that means that actually uh, this MS formula can be used not only for the medium manganese steels but also for the other uh, third generation advanced high strength steels like for example tripenetic ferrite or quenching and partitioning steels where actually the, the remaining austenite is stabilized at room temperature by a higher uh, carbon content. 
then we applied this um, MS temperature, uh, this new derived uh, a formula to the Demore model with the kinetic factors of uh, Lee and the Coman, and you can see there are a certain improvement. That also this Martin's eye line uh, was shifted uh, to higher temperatures, and then in turn also the written Austin line followed the same trend. We could actually also uh, estimate, so it was better estimation of the written austenite uh, content uh, for the calculation compared to um, to the laboratory results. So we can say that we can actually perform a model improvement by the incorporation of a new MS formula, but just now we're taking account only just the nominal chemical composition in the equilibrium stage without knowing any other microstructural features, like for example, grain size uh, of the microstructure. But you can see there is still a certain uh, deviation uh, or shift of uh, experimental data uh, to calculations. The further model improvement is necessary, and there are there are more factors. Uh, um, actually, they are responsible for this shift. The two most important are actually the incorporation of predicted ferrite formation and also grain size of written all to its model, which should be then really made in the future. So this brings me now to the laboratory evaluation. So here you can see uh, so the microstructure and mechanical properties of medium manganese steel subjected to one step and two step uh, heat treatment. So now we concentrate on microstructure. You can see that for the one step uh, heat treat samples, so we obtain this polygonal structure, whereas for the two step heat treatment, this predominantly lamellar uh, microstructure uh, was obtained. Now when we look at the lower in technical annealing temperatures, somewhere at five, 580 degrees C. So the microstructure still contains an undissolved uh, cementite. Uh, retained austenite is rather small, it's heavily enriched in manganese, therefore it's kind of uh, over, over stabilized. And then we are becoming such a, a peculiar curves, like here in this case, actually ideally a plastic curve uh, for one step heat treatment and with a certain uh, slow straining also for a two-step heat treatment machine. Now, when we increase the temperature uh, further, cementite is dissolved um, and written austenite that appropriate um, a stability is formed, uh, which then also results in the optimal combination of uh, mechanical properties. Now, increasing the temperature even further, intercritical austenite becomes uh, larger, therefore it cannot be uh, mechanically stabilized and also um, the chemical composition of retained austenite uh, decreases and therefore uh, upon final cooling it comes to the partial uh, martistic formation as you can see here from the uh, from the uh, from the microstructure which increases the strength and deteriorates uh, the elongation now comparing uh one step and two step heat treatment in terms of mechanical properties uh, it is clear this two-step heat treatment uh, results in the better combination of mechanical properties, and this is due to the higher retained austenite stability of this lamellar retained austenite uh, compared to the blocky one. Furthermore, it is also obvious from the graphs that uh, these two-step heat treatment regimes uh, actually results in much lower um, yield point elongation, and this is due to the lamellar structure and also optimal retained austenite uh, stability. And this lamellar structure allows for formation of dislocation subgrains. Um, and uh, therefore, the strain hardening is allowed and uh, the localization of deformation in the form of rudus bands is either reduced or even completely prohibited. So more information to that you can actually find them in this uh, publication. Then we also look at the influence of annealing time, not just for a two-step uh, heat treatment in the soaking stage. And you can see that as we increase the intercritical annealing time in this soaking stage, the written austenite content increases, and then it saturates for a longer um, annealing times, which are actually suitable uh, for a lengthy batch annealing heat treatment, which is a very good message for us. Now looking at the mechanical properties, so it is clear as we increase uh, the intercritical annealing time, the yield strength decreases and the tensile strength and total elongation increases. And then it also saturates for the long uh, annealing times. And this is uh, 
mostly due to the uh, more uh, trip effect, as I will show you then later, and also this decrease of grain size also partially to the fried grain coarsening, which I'm, which I'm not going to show you in the course of this presentation. So now let's focus on this trip effect and retain austenite stability. So we determine it by uh, means of interrupted tensile uh, testing. Uh, so we kind of pre-strain uh, the uh, the tensile uh, samples to different degrees of strain, and then uh, we determine the retained austenite uh, content uh, by means of the saturation maximization method in post-mortem stage. And then one obtains uh, the diagrams of retained austenite content as a function of true strain, but it's kind of a difficult time times uh, to compare uh, these curves with each other. Therefore, we use a simple linearization method by means of ludwigson berger relation. As you can see here, actually the most important term in this equation is this KP value, which represents the retain austenite stability. The higher the KP value, the lower the retain austenite stability. And then we plot um, this KP value as a function of indicative handling uh, time. And it is evident that uh, as we now increase the indicative handling time, the KP value increases, uh, meaning a decrease in retained austenite stability, and it starts saturating again uh, for a lengthy batch handling hit treatment times. What is now the reason uh, for this um, decrease in austenite stability? So we look at it now experimental, um, exemplarily for 8 and 32 hours, and you know, so we can look at the chemistry of retained austenite and also the grain size of retained austenite as a two decisive factors in influence the retained austenite stability. So, so first, uh, the chemistry of retained austenites, we look at the manganese content by, by EDX. And you can see here between the PCC and FCC phase that after eight hours, the manganese is already partitioned between this PCC, which is this darker phase, and FCC, which is this uh, brighter phase in this diagram. And you can also see that there's actually no difference in chemical composition between eight and 32 hours. So we can actually insist uh, that um, this decrease in austenite stability uh, does not uh, stem uh, from the chemistry of retained austenite. On the contrary, now when we look at the equivalent uh, circle diameter of retained austenite uh, determined by uh, EBSD, again, for this 8 and 32 hours, and now when we concentrate on this range with larger um, grain size of retained austenite, since these smaller ones will be overstabilized um, anyhow, we can see that for 32 hours, so we have a uh, grain coarsening, which will then actually be responsible for a uh, decreased retained austenite uh, stability with an increased handling time. And now with this knowledge, so we could uh, perform the first industrial trials and we use this 0.12 carbon 5.8 manganese uh, chemistry, and we uh, produce the steel in our uh, steel mill, also conven conventional LD converter routine, uh, followed by continuous caster, and then produced uh, down uh, to annealing and ultra galvanizing in order to become a 780 grade uncoated or ultra galvanized. And you can see now here the results uh, after final uh, annealing. So for first, this one step heat treatment, um, which uh, took place in the conventional uh, pitch handling furnace. And you can see actually here uh, the microstructure after lepra color etching. So, so you could see this, this microstructure was uh, globular. Uh, we have a large amount of retained austenite, which is this brownish face uh, in, in the microstructure. And then uh, this light blue face and ferrite. We can also see that this ferrite was um, heavily uh, textured. Uh, which led to profound uh, anisotropy of mechanical properties and also a uh, deterioration of whole expansion performance, which represents the stretch frangibility of a steel. That means that such a material cannot be delivered to our customers from the automotive industry. On the contrary, uh, looking at the two step heat treated um, material, where the first heat treatment took place at the continuous and link line, and then the final heat treatment took. Uh, place in the pitch uh, annealing furnace. So we obtain this uh, predominantly lamellar structure with a large amount of retained austenite. And you could see due to this lamellar structure, uh, the texture was um, significantly weakened. Therefore, we did not observe uh, any uh, profound anisotropy in mechanical properties. 
but this heat treatment also led to the significant uh, improvement of mechanical properties and actually um, uh, elongation and also the whole expansion performance was actually doubled uh, compared to the previous case. So such a material we could already uh, deliver uh, to our customers from the automotive industry for the first evaluation and screening. So this leads me now to the conclusions. So first, uh, improved prediction of microstructural development in case of medium manganese steels was enabled by the incorporation of a newly developed MS formula, formula uh, to uh, the more model. Laboratory development revealed a strong dependence of mechanical properties with annealing temperature, reaching a steady state at given temperature when applying a longer annealing times, typical for batch annealing. Then industrial production of medium manganese steels via conventional converter routine followed by continuous casting seems to be feasible. And by the application of this two-step heat treatment applied to 0.12 carbon, 5.8 manganese chemistry led to the production of 780 grade uh, with total elongation in reaching 35%. So we have now 780 grade and we make further development activities uh, towards grades with higher strengths. That means uh, 980 MPA and higher. And in this context, I would also like to um, invite you to the upcoming fifth international high manganese steel uh, conference, which will uh, take place at the end of May uh, 2022 uh, in Linz, and we organize it together with Professor Schneider from the same same university as Ludovic. Abstract submission due is end of October 2021, so you are all uh, cordially invited. Thank you very much, and I'm really keen to hear your questions. Thank you.